Welcome back to the post-lunch session. Um, I just want to say I'm delighted to be here. I completely understand that postprandial um, lull. On the other hand, there is a very real excitement about being here in conversation with Philip, because this is a conversation that marks the completion of his seven-volume translation of the Ramayana, very specifically the Ram Charit Manas by Tulsi Das, the great poet of the 16th century. And the Ramayana, I think, is known to us all in some way or the other as the great ep one of the great epics of the world, but also a story that is so foundational for everyone in the Indian subcontinent that the poet and scholar A.K. Ramanujan once said that no one can quite remember in India the very first time they heard the Ramayana or the Mahabharata. It's like we've always known it. We've had mothers and grandmothers tell us stories from it, but that was never the first time we heard it. And so there is, for me, a very deep insight in that observation. It certainly holds true for me, as it does for so many others. And I think that allows everyone to feel like an equal claimant to this story. It belongs to us all. There is truly a sense of ownership because it is such a part of our collective DNA. So I'm delighted to be in conversation with Philip. And uh, Philip, as I've said before, sitting right here, I'm a sucker for stories, of, uh, for personal journey stories. And in your case, you've spent, when you spend 12 years translating something, it's not just a romance, it's a marriage. <laughs> Huh? So, tell us about, first, about the encounter between Philip and Tulsidas, that romance. Yeah, well, that, of course, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, the mic is working, good. Um, it begins with Philip and India, um, which goes back to 1971. Actually, before that, it goes back to me being in high school in New York City, reading books like the Gita and the Upanishads in the public library, uh, being attracted to a particular modern Indian spiritual master, Meher Baba, and uh, going to India right out of college for the first time, 1971, uh, partly to pay my respects at the Samadhi, the tomb of Meher Baba, but also partly to see these amazing places that I had read about. And, and, and I must have already heard about Tulsi Das by that time, because I know I had read some version of the, of the Ramayana story. But that was when I fell in love with India. That was when I wanted to learn Hindi. I realized the limitations of English for communicating with people. And that set me on a path. Seven years later, I went, started in graduate school uh, at the University of Chicago and learned quite a good deal about the Tulsi Ramayana in a class on cultural history of North India. And um, when I was good enough in my Hindi after going to India for a year for study, advanced study, um, I started reading Tulsi Ramayana with one of my professors at Chicago. And this professor was, he was actually a linguist. He was neither a literature nor a religious studies person. But he had been raised with Tulsi Ramayana. He was a Punjabi, by the way, a Punjabi Hindu. But the Manas was very much, the Manas is the abbreviation of the, title, the kind of unwieldy title, Ram Charit Manas, which means, let's see, I, I have a visual. So this, this uh, is kind of what you might call a, a Ramayana map of India, in the sense only that it covers some of the very popular vernacular local language retellings of the Ramayana that, that have um, been composed in roughly the last thousand years or so. Uh, but there are many, many more, hundreds more. But these are the, some of the big names. And as you can see, Tulsi does because he writes in a language that is a form of Hindi, and because Hindi has a really big uh, audience in the Indo-Gangetic plain, that green area in the map, you know, it, we, we're talking about mm, 500 million people or so in the sort of core audience area of the Tulsi Das Ramayana. Um, oh, there he is. Um, 
a, a traditional picture of him. Um, but here, this will just show you the title. So it's the, the Manas refers to the holy lake Manasarovar in the Himalayas near Mount Kailash. Um, and Tulsidas uses it as an allegory. He, he has a beautiful framing allegory for the poem in which uh, it's conceived of as this profound lake uh, of wisdom and devotion. And then charita means the no noble or exemplary deeds of someone. And of course, Ram is the name of the hero. So you, as, as Daisy said so nicely this morning, Hindi is a left branching language. So you, you read from right, you read the title from right to left. It's the, the Manas Lake of the Noble Deeds of Ram, is what Ram to Manas means. Okay, anyway, I had, I had heard of it. I read it with this uh, professor, and um, we read very slowly and with a lot of discussion and a lot of explanation of the grammar. But one of the great things about that first reading was that he taught me to recite, to chant. Uh, in the way that he had learned since childhood. Uh, and so right away, uh, and, and that became so important to my study of the text as a, as a performed text, um, as a text that lives as much through orality uh, as through literate uh, readers. And um, yeah, that, that was my first encounter with it. And then I spent, I read probably and a tenth or an eighth of it with this professor over the course of an entire academic year. And then the entire next academic year, I finished it on my own. So two years was the first reading. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. No, not uh, at all. Maybe. So this goes back well before 12 years. We are talking oh, this, about... We're talking about uh, 1978 to... <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's much more than a marriage even. Yeah. But, uh, I've been involved with this text for yes, over 40 so years. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, for many people, I think, uh, Philip, despite the fact that there are all the, all the stories that you mentioned, all those versions, all those tellings of the Ramayana, mm -hmm. for many people, the definitive version remains, at least in their minds, the Valmiki version, the Sanskrit version. We know that Tulsidas himself acknowledges a great debt to that version, right? Mm -hmm. And... Uh, he also talks of other tellings. Is that the Adhyatma Ramayana as well? He or doesn't not? mention it by name, but okay. it's clear that he knew it and was influenced by it. Okay. Yeah. So what is it really that makes the Tulsi telling, the Ramcharitmanas, yeah. so different? Is it different from the Valmiki? It's very, and how? very different. One hears about it largely as a devotional text. Yeah, uh, it's absolutely permeated by uh, a, a strong uh, emotion of reverent devotion to, to Ram and Sita, Sita Ram, really a kind of a divine dyad. Um, but um, just to backtrack a little bit, one of the really interesting things about the Ramayana tr tradition, and I just wrote a long essay on the history of translation of the Ramayana, and one of the really interesting things is that in India, there almost never was any what we think of today as translation of the Ramayana, in the sense of a close uh, linguistic transfer between one language and another. The Valmiki Ramayana was held in great reverence. Everybody pays homage to it. But there are no translations of it before the colonial period, um, in the, in, again, in this modern sense of the term. And what was so interesting is that th thousands of storytellers and authors chose to retell the story in their own way. And there's changes in all of them. They all innovate, they all, they're all creative, they, they, they felt the freedom to exercise that kind of license with a, you know, a scripture, quote unquote, a holy text, but it was not um, set in stone. There was a lot of changes possible. Now, Tulsidas, um, Oh, uh, ha uh, a good third of his opening book, which is the longest book in the epic, is this long prologue um, in which he talks about all sorts of things. He talks in his own voice. It's before he introduces his other narrators. Um, uh, another innovation, there are four narrators. And they come in and out 
of the, of the narration at different times, and each of them has a different point of view. The, the, the Manas is, you could say, a multivocal text. It sort of anticipates this you know, hip postmodern notion of, of there being no definitive one version of a story. It's, it's kind of postmodern already in 1574. And um, there are some big changes in the story. For example, and this is almost a technicality, but um, Sita is never actually kidnapped by Ravana. Um, surprise! Yeah, uh, that's because by Tulsidas's time, Sita was so revered as the feminine side of God, as the mother of the universe, as the great goddess, that the idea of Ravana, you know, physically touching her and carrying her off was just, an, already in the Kamban Ramayana, this is very much problematized. He has to pick up the, the earth that she's standing on. He can't touch her. Um, so what Tulsidas does, and he's following an earlier uh, Ramayana called the Adhyatma that you mentioned, is um, just before Ravana comes to steal Sita, Rama and Sita have this little tete-a-tete and Rama says, my dear, I have to perform a, 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 a human lila, manava lila, uh, a, you know, a human play, sport. Would you mind stepping into the fire? And so they have this, you know, this hearth fire in their hut, and Sita goes into the fire, and she creates a shadow of herself, chaya Sita an illusion of herself, Maya Sita. And then the story just goes on, you know, like in the traditional uh, Valmiki Ramayana. And the shadow behaves exactly the way you would expect Sita to behave. And there's plenty of emotion and everything, but it, it creates this sort of theological ruse where we don't actually have Sita being touched by Ravana. And then in the, in the so-called fire test at the end, where Sita is expected to prove her chastity in Valmiki, that's not what happens in Tulsidas. The, sh the shadow Sita goes into the fire to be burned up so that the real Sita can come back out. Now, it's easy to overlook these two little passages and, and just, it, see, it seems as if they don't happen, but I mean, that's a big change. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. There are, and there are many others. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned in your introduction that there are nine, or now you say ten, yeah. uh, English translations yeah. of the Ramcharitmanas yeah. available. But you suggest, you don't quite say so, but you suggest that uh, some have more rhyme and others have more reason, but perhaps those two don't quite come together in the way that you'd like. Yeah, well, I mean, the question for me, of course, is why do another one, right? Yes. Um, by the way, I just want to, let me just point something out to you all uh, in this slide. This is a page from, you know, a standard Hindi uh, edition um, by the Gita Press. And as you can see, so the, bo the bold face is Tulsidas's verses. And then underneath that is a gloss in modern Hindi Kardiboli, modern spoken Hindi prose. Um, so the Manas is translated all the time for its own audience in North India because the language of Tulsidas is sort of roughly somewhere between Chaucer and Shakespeare for people today. It's not easy. You need a, you need a most people need a crib. Uh, they need something to help them. So, I mean, the, translating it is not something that just Gaurav foreigners do, you know. I mean, it's, <laughs> people do it in India too. So, um, yeah, I mean, it has a long history of English translation, and um, the series that I've that I've done my translation for the the Murti Classical Library of India. On the whole, they're trying to publish works that have not been published before, not been translated before or the only translations available are very outdated Victorian, you know, very different kind of diction. Um, they want to bring out fresh translations. And I said to the uh, general editor, Sheldon Pollock, when he approached me, I said, you know, why do you want to do Ram Manas? It's probably the most translated large pre-modern uh, vernacular text. 
And he said, yeah, but it's so important. It's just, you know, it's, it's such a cultural phenomenon, such a monumental text. We, we really want it to be in our series. So, and, and that was okay for me because I had never liked any of the translations. Um, I had never wanted to use them in classes with students. And I had tried my hand at doing one of the, small, the shorter uh, sub books of it back in um, the late 90s after Ramanujan passed away because he was one of my, my mentors at Chicago. And I was inspired to go to the Manas and try to start translating in a little different way. I was trying to be more like Raman, <laughs> you know, and less like Philip. So anyway, that's, that's interesting. did I answer tell your us, question? No, you didn't, but tell us more about what you said just now. What um, does that mean? To be more like Raman? Yes. Well, it's what you and, it's what you and, uh, no, it's what, um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, the other Subramaniam here, Manasi. It's what Manasi and Daisy were talking about this morning, you know, being more, a little more playful, a little more trying to evoke the, the bhava, of the mood, uh, rather than the letter. Yes. Um, although in the end, I think I'm, I'm, pretty close to the letter, at least that's, that's been my I think aim. what I was struck by is the fact that it is a free verse translation. Yeah, it's a free and verse. And I'm, I'm very glad that it, yeah. that it is one. There's a relaxed, unhurried quality about this mm -hmm. translation. And I think very often reaching for, there's a particular kind of tripping, somewhat facile rhyming quality that sometimes sets in mm -hmm. when one tries too hard to turn to a sort of metrical alternative right yeah. away. So I was very glad that wasn't the case here. Mm. You know, so in fact, I'm going to ask you to read from it very yeah. soon. Yeah. But before that, I want to ask you, you know, because the most exciting thing about this really, Philip, at least as far as I'm concerned, is about the process of rolling up your sleeves and getting one's hands muddy in the text. Mm. You know, the business of translation. Mm. So that's the process I'd really like to talk about. And you mentioned, just for a start, I mean, maybe we could talk about this. You mentioned that Tulsidas has 22 words for beautiful yeah. and 29 words for lotus, mm. which is perhaps not surprising in India. But what happens when, as a translator, you run short of words in your thesaurus? How do you approach this? Talk about some of the challenges of this. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it, the, the, the two lexicons, the lexicon of Hindi and the lexicon of English, are very uh, asymmetrical. And um, as, you, as you point out, lotus, beautiful. Uh, there are something, I forget the number now, but there are nine or ten verbs for seeing. And, um, you know, much of the action revolves around seeing the beauty of Ram and Sita and, and their, their world that they live in. It's a text about darshan, about having auspicious vision uh, of the divine. So yeah, I mean, I, I use the full extent of English vocabulary as known to me, leaving aside archaic words. Um, Lotus, I often just don't translate. Um, because uh, if you read some of the, some of the translations uh, that are very, very word by word, you know, then you'll, you'll discover that Ram sp speaks from his lotus lips while, while lifting his lotus hand, and Hanuman is bowing at his lotus feet, and Sita is gazing at the beauty of his lotus face, um, but, but they're all different words in the original, see? And, and the words have a different uh, sound, and they have a different metrical weight, and they fit in. Some of them evoke all kinds of associations, like uh, Jalaja, born from the water, um, Vanaja, born in the forest. And these are all words for lotus, right? So um, basically, you know, he's just ba saying that Ram is very, very beautiful. So sometimes I would use lovely or, or his lovely hands or something like that, or just not put an adjective there at all. Because I was also trying to preserve um, some of the compactness of Tulsidas. Tulsidas is, as you'll see when we, when we do a little sample, it's very terse, uh, very rhythmic, 
very, very metrical, but, but he, he says a lot in few words, and a translator inevitably has to add more words to, to make it make sense in English. But I didn't want to do prose. The Morty series asked for another prose translation, and out of these 10, seven of them are prose. And I've never liked any of them, and I said, no, mm -hmm. I won't. And, and two of them are into absolutely awful rhyme. Just unbearable, you know, Hallmark card poetry that makes you want to tear your hair out. And, and, and they take all kinds of liberties in order to try to get the rhymes, yes. you know. Yes. Yeah. And of course, there's the other whole question, Philip, of turning this very vibrant oral performative tradition and bringing that to this <clears throat> hushed, you know, white silence of the printed page. Silent you know, reading. How does that, yeah. ha was that also a challenge? I assume it was. I mean, it's a, it's a challenge in the sense that it's something that I thought about, but I mean, you can't get away from the fact that a lot of people silently read books now. I mean, that's, that's how it is. I would, yes. I would love it if people gathered in little groups and sat around and recited <laughs> my translation, and if they know Hindi, they could do it back and forth. You know, that, that would be ideal, but that's, I, I can't assume that kind of a, a readership. Yeah, but which is exactly why we're going to be reading yeah, from it now. Let's do but a tell me, does, yeah. does this mean that you just sat every day? Just give us a sense of yeah. the process. You sat every day and hammered out a particular yeah, number um, of... Uh, basically starting in about sometime in 2010 and ending about, I don't know, a year ago, I was almost every day. And eh, two, three hours, mm -hmm. usually in the early morning. Um, and I would recite. I would recite the passage that I was working on, and I would then recite the lines multiple times as I thought about how to try to, try to convey them in English. And I do not attempt to do rhyme at all. And I initially tried doing quite a bit of alliteration. Tulsi Das is very into alliteration, as you'll hear in a minute. But it doesn't work in English, in, in you know, written English. It, it's, it ends up sounding very contrived. Um, and so I had to really tone that down as well. I got some very wonderful input on the first two volumes from the se senior editors. Um, and, that, and by the third volume, uh, the senior editor said to me, you found your voice. And they didn't give me as much input. And I, it was really working. But it wasn't, I wasn't alone. Uh, we talked about this. Yes. Tul Tulsi Das was there, sort of, in his way. I'm yeah. sure. Yeah, well. I'm sure. Yeah. But I want to, do you want to read a bit? Because I yeah, want to, otherwise I'll get back to this question of how Tulsi Das was present. Let's, uh, here, this, I'm going to give this to you because I, I located it in my copy here. So we're going to be starting with the, for my part. Right. Do you want me to read it first? Uh, no, no. I'll, I'll, I'll read it. Okay. So um, at the beginning of the, uh, the epic, um, Tulsidas is very much aware of the fact that he's starting an epic undertaking. And there's this long section where he's paying homage to you know, the planets and the sun and the moon and all the different deities and the rivers and the city of Ayodhya and uh, Ram City and all, all sorts of things, uh, his, his gurus. Um, you know, and he's asking for their help in this tremendous task that he's going to undertake, which is telling the, the story of Ram in Pasha, the, the language, the everyday language of the people. Um, and then he has a section where he's praising the, the, the good people, holy people, the sadhus and sants, the, the, the saintly ones. And then that's followed by a section in which he praises villains, scoundrels, bad people. And it's quite long, and it's quite sarcastic. Uh, and you get, a, you get an interesting feeling of his kind of a little bit, uh, uh, how should we, confrontational personality there. Particularly since some of these bad people were, were, were people who were going to criticize his poem. 
uh, you know, for writing in, in, the, in the everyday language, writing a sacred uh, Sanskrit story in the, in the everyday language. So um, I'm going to read the end of this uh, praise of scoundrels section, and then he goes into a kind of comparison of uh, the, the scoundrels and the saints. Uh, and I'll, I'm just going to chant a bit of it so you get a feeling for the alliteration and the sound in, uh, in Tulsi's uh, pre-modern Hindi dialect of Avadi, and then Arundhati will read my translation. Main apni desi ki nhani hora, tin hani jo ora na lau babhora, baya sapali ahi ati anuraga, ho hi nira misha kabahu ki kaga. Bando santa asajana charana, duka prada ubaya beach a kachu varana, bichura te eka prana hari lehi, milata eka duka daruna dehi, upajahi eka sanga jagamahi, jalaja jonka jimmy guna bilagahi, sudha sura samasadhu asadhu. Janaka eka jaga jaladhi agadhu. Okay. <laughs> I think that... For my part, I have beseeched them, but they are unlikely to change their ways. Though you rear it with utmost affection, will a crow ever become vegetarian? I reverence the feet of saints and scoundrels. Both cause sorrow, but with a difference. Separation from one steals away the soul, and mere association with the other gives bitter pain. Though arisen together in this world, they differ in nature like lotus and leech. Like nectar and liquor, the body, the holy and the wicked, are born of the world's one fathomless sea. By their own kind or unkind acts, each garners the prize of fame or disgrace. Nectar, moonlight, holy Ganga and saints, poison, wildfire, polluted stream and savage hunter, all know the merit and demerits of each, but favor whatever suits their nature. Hmm. Thank you. That was lovely. Are we reading more? No, okay. not right now. <laughs> okay. But we'll come back to more. I, I just realized I had left something in here that I wanted. But, oh. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I'm actually going back to what you touched on earlier, Philip, which is this somewhat enigmatic but very intimate relationship that exists between the writer and the translator. Yeah. And I'm sure that in the past so many years, I was going to say 12, but you say since 1978. So it almost feels like you've probably spent more time with a long dead bhakti poet from Northern India than you've probably spent with many of the other people embodied around you. So I'm just curious about what, yes. I'm curious about what this relationship is about. Tell us more, because it is a mysterious relationship. Yeah. It is an intimate one. Yeah. Well, of course, you know, my early work, my, my um, PhD project, and it became a book, uh, was about the, the role of this text in its cultural context. So it was a kind of a literary ethnography, you know. Um, and I wasn't focusing so much on Tulsidas himself, although you can't avoid Tulsidas in this text. He's very much in it, and his kind of interesting personality and quirkiness comes out. So I did, in, in, in that way, have a relationship with him from the beginning of my involvement with the Manas. But um, from the point at which I actually decided I was going to, and I'll just say that what what really got me to do this was the, the creation of the Murti Classical Library by uh, Rohan Murti, uh, his gift to uh, Harvard University Press to create a, uh, a series. And Sheldon Pollock was the general editor, and he was one of the people that I worked with at Iowa. He, he was one of the people who hired me, Sanskrit professor. 
Um, and uh, somebody that I greatly respected, uh, himself a translator of um, two khandas of the Valmiki Ramayana. And their, their idea was to create a, a classical library of India of, of great texts in all the languages of the subcontinent, uh, created before roughly 1800, um, available in relatively inexpensive but very beautifully made, very handsome, uh, standard one size, you know, one, one uh, format volumes with the original text on the left page and the uh, translation on the right. This is a page spread from one of my volumes. And uh, that, so that format, you know, intrigued me, but I'm not, I'm getting, I'm veering off your question, but I wanted to, I want to plug the Morty series because I really believe in it. And it's one of the reasons why I took up this project. Mm -hmm. um, as far as Tulsi goes, Ra one of the things that Ramanujan once said to me was, he said, the only way you really get to know a text really well is by translating it. Mm -hmm. And um, so that the relationship that you're put in with it, you know, in those daily sessions, um, yeah, that was a very, it became very special and very meaningful to me. I, I don't think I realized when I started out how much I was going to enjoy this. Uh, it's been a really beautiful and delightful journey uh, of over a decade. And can I say one more thing, because you like stories. I was going to say that you promised me a story <laughs> yeah, yesterday. Yeah, so here's a story. So I actually finished, so the first, uh, Balkhand, the first book of Tulsi Das's uh, seven books, is the longest. It's about a, more than a third of the entire Manas. And it came out as two volumes in the format of the series. But I finished the draft of that um, just as I was in India at the time, and I was doing research on a completely different thing, but I was working every morning on, on the Manas, and then I would go out and do my other research. And um, I had to go to Banaras for some work, and I had just finished the, the first draft, and I arrived in Benares, and I noticed that there were decorations on the street, and uh, it's always some festival or other in Benares, you know. But I really hadn't been paying attention. I mean, this is almost a confession, uh, but I hadn't been paying much attention to the calendar, and I asked my friends, you know, ye konsa tyohar, hey, what, you know, what, what festival is this? And they said, oh, it's, it's Ram Nami. <laughs> I really didn't know. <laughs> It was, it was Ram's birthday, the, 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 the traditional celebration of the birth of Ram. And I was staying at Asighat in a hotel, and I, Tulsi's house is right there. And I was able to take my little stick drive uh, with the text on it over to Tulsi Das's house and put it on this, what they say is traditionally considered to be his gaddi, his his seat, and it, it just all felt so right, and I, so fortunate, you know. And then one of my wonderful mentors from the early 80s was still alive, and I went to see him that day and told him about the project, and he sort of gave me his ashirvad, and it, it was just a very auspicious conjunction, you know, coming together at that point. Absolutely. Yeah. And when was this? This was when That you were was in 2011. In, uh, when you uh, were just April, beginning. April of 2011, yeah, yeah. Hmm. That was when I finished the Balkan yeah, okay. draft. I'm going to return, Philip, yeah. to, uh, to Ram, yeah. as we see him in Tulsi Das, yeah. because, you know, the figure of Rama, many think of as... Uh, you know, there have been lots of attempts to reconstruct him and sanitize him and freeze him and do all sorts of things with him, perhaps inevitably, because he is such a significant figure in our mm -hmm. lives, really, a living figure. But uh, I'm, I don't, you know, the thing is he does resist easy pigeonholing, I think, despite the fact that he is seen as this epitome of perfection and yeah. all of it. So I'm curious about Tulsi Das and who is Tulsi Das's Ram? I'm just going to get this off the screen, lest people um, spend their time reading it. Mm -hmm. well, I'll, I'll go back to uh, something. Sorry. Yeah, who is Tulsi Das's Ram? He is um, 
simultaneously both completely divine and fully human, um, which is something that you know many traditions grapple with, right? There's the whole controversy about Jesus, uh, Jesus' divinity, was he, was he aware of it? Was he sometimes aware of it, sometimes not? The Buddha, the Buddhists went through huge debates about this, you know, what does it mean to be uh, awakened, you know? Um, and one of the themes that runs through Tulsi from beginning to end is, you know, is Ram the same as the sort of non-dual, uh, infinite, eternal um, divinity, deity? Um, and the answer is yes, <laughs> according to Tulsi Das. Uh, but the Manas is a, a huge exposition on trying to, to come to terms with this. Um, he's not human in the same way that Valmiki's Ram is human. He's always aware of his own divinity, and many of the people around him are aware of his divinity as well. Um, at the same time, he he's, can be funny. He has a sense of humor. Um, there are playful moments. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say. I'm not, I'm, it's never been my job to you know, defend Tulsi Das or to necessarily endorse everything he says. I'm trying to present modern readers with a, a clear, straightforward rendering of it, and they can make their own judgments you know, and about You mentioned Ram. that very yeah. clearly in your introduction. Yeah. And I think that was, that was bound to be my next question, really, yeah. because we do hear a great deal said about seeming gender and caste biases in Tulsi Das. And yet, I'm assuming that for you as a translator, when you work on a pre-modern text with a completely different worldview, um, I'm asked, actually, it is a question. Yeah. Do you, are you tempted at some point to sidestep or paper over or just adapt a little bit? Or do you think that we need to confront the text with all its complexities? They may be inconvenient for us today, but this is the text. Closer to the last perspective that you outlined, I would say. Uh, I, I think it's necessary to, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you a story about that. Um, so Tulsi Das, in many ways, is, is full of negative judgments about women despite the fact that he adores Sita uh, as the mother of the universe. And there are some other very good women in the story, and exemplary women, and lots of holy women. But there are also a lot of just kind of casual comments about women's nature and implication that women are not as, as uh, smart uh, as men. Kind of standard, you know, 16th century male a male-dominated society perspective. Um, I don't attempt to whitewash those or avoid them. Um, I do uh, tend to translate, he uses the word nara a lot, meaning a human being, a person, but you can also translate it as man, just the, just the way in English man has been a stand-in for, you know, for humankind. And uh, early on, I had a conversation with my friend Linda Hess, who's also a very fine translator, especially of Kabir. Kabir. Yeah. And I said to her, Linda, what do you think should I do with Nutter? Should I translate it as man? And she said, why make Tulsi Das more misogynist than he already is? So I, I usually go with person or one yeah, uh, for, for, for that. But I, the story is, I had a, a female grad student quite a few years ago at Iowa who came to me and said she wanted to read Tulsi Das. And she was a very good advanced Hindi student. And um, I, are we running out of time already? Wow. And I, uh, and I was surprised because she was a really strong feminist. And I said, are you sure you, you really want to read Tulsi? And she said, yes, I, want, I, I feel I need to know the enemy. So, so I said, okay, okay, okay. So, you know, we sat, but she was good. And we sat down and we started reading. I wanted her to start from the beginning of Balkan, which is incredibly brilliant poetry. And she loved poetry. And we started reading and I started explaining stuff to her. And as the weeks went on, she would, she would start saying things like, 
wow, this is really good. <laughs> you know, this, this guy really could write, you know. And, and finally, I mean, the, the, finally she said, well, you know, I don't agree with everything he says, but boy, he, I, I understand now why this text is so revered. You know, he's, he's just amazing poetry. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And of course, we have to end with poetry. So we're not going... But we're I not think going to have time. I'll do no. one, the one line. Shall we take a couple of questions? We should take and questions. And then end with the poetry. Should okay. we do that? Does that sound right? End with the sound of poetry. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, again, thank you for an amazing session. A lot of modern day controversies which sort of involve Ram, be that either the classic Dalit Savarna controversy or Qom's feminists might have or temple controversy, a lot of them try to either appropriate or misappropriate Ram's character. And the volume seven, the Uttar Kant is, finds itself at the center of a lot of these controversies because it's not in the original Valmiki Ramayana, if I, if I think. So could you tell us a bit about why did Tulsida sort of think about adding the Uttarakhand? And was it like a deeper commentary on the times of, of Mughal India or a changing Hindu religion or yeah. any of those? Well, so for those of you who don't know, you know too much about the Ramayana, um, the, the first book and the last book in many Ramayanas are a kind of an introduction and an epilogue. Um, and Valmiki's... Um, uh, Uttarakhand, the last book, is very different in style from earlier books, and there's been a lot of controversy among Sanskrit scholars as to whether it's by the same author or not. It is part of the critical edition that was done in India in the, in the 1960s and 70s, um, because it's found in the oldest known manuscripts. So, you know, it hasn't been uh, eliminated, but, the, but it's controversial because it's the, it's the section in which Rama repudiates and abandons Sita when she's pregnant because of rumors about her chastity among the people, and he sends her away into the forest. And it's a, it's a sad, it's a tra in a way, a tragic ending of the Ramayana, although she ultimately, the, well, she sort of comes back. But anyway, I'm not going to go into that. Tulsi Das doesn't tell that story at all. Tulsi Das's Uttarakhand, if you know, not to hold your breath, but my, my translation's coming out in a couple of months. But uh, it, doesn't, it has nothing to do with that whatsoever. And two thirds of his Uttarakhand, at the end of Tulsi Das, they sort of live happily ever after, as far as we know. He just doesn't go there. He doesn't tell us anything further. Um, I mean, he was aware of that that story. He even alludes to it at one point earlier in the, in the text, but he doesn't tell it. He chooses not to. But two-thirds of Uttarakhand is this marvelous, incredible, fantastical, surrealistic discourse by a crow, uh, an immortal crow, Kak Bhushundi, yes. to uh, Garuda, to Vishnu's uh, divine eagle. Uh, on the nature of God, and on the nature of the soul, and the nature of Maya illusion. Uh, and it's, it's amazing. And um, that's, how, that's how he ends the epic. The, the crow has the last word. And you know, the crow is considered the untouchable among birds, uh, among other things, but he's also very smart. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. It's, there's a lot of really strange things in the Ramcharitmanas that you might not expect. Yeah. So as you were very rightly this, saying, this is still a very living text for us. Yeah. And uh, I grew up in uh, Uttar Pradesh and, you know, I heard this. Yeah. I cannot read Hindi, but I was told the whole Ramcharitmanas. Yeah. But then my grandmother, who had a sense of humor, told me this very short form of the Ramayana. Ek tha Ram, ek tha Ravana, vane vaki siya churai, vane vaki lanka dahai. Baat ka ban gaya baatanna, tulsi li gaya pothanna. Wow. Wonderful. So, yeah. This is in five sentences. Yeah, yeah, tulsi yeah. Tulsi Yeah. There's, um, well, the, yes. I'd have to go back through it again line by line. But, 
Once there was a Ram, once there was a Ravana. There was a Ram and there was a Ravan. He stole, Ravan stole Sita. Sita. Ram burnt down his Lanka. But you don't, isn't Vanar in there? Isn't there a no. monkey? Vane, Vane means oh. Usne. Vane, Achacha. Achacha. Vane Vaki. Sa. Ah. So, so, and Ram burnt his Lanka. So, from this became a huge story. And out of this, Tulsi wrote his Pothanna. Pothanna, Pothanna means like a very long story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's, there's also, of course, um, there's a Sanskrit uh, saying, which I don't know in Sanskrit, but it's, you know, a Ramayana is a story in which Ram kills uh, Ravana, which is actually not always true because there are, there are Ramayanas in which Lakshman kills Ravana and there's one, there's a Bengali one in which Sita kills Ravana, as you would expect in Bengal. Yeah. So, so Philip, to do this translation, did you have to kind of uh, dive into other forms of Hindi than what you had known? I gather this is sort of like Elizabethan English or... Even, even a little bit more mm -hmm. archaic than that. And, and yeah. so did you have to go to school on that in order to... No, uh, you know, I never properly took a course. There are now people who teach Avati grammar, but I never properly uh, studied that. But. When f the research that I did for my, my book, The Life of a Text, um, I was hanging out with Ramayana performers in the Banaras area and other places um, for over a year. And I became just very immersed in the language. And, um, and the more I read it, and the more I read it with modern Hindi commentaries accompanying it, the more I started to get the grammatical patterns. So I kind of learned them intuitively, but um, I've checked it out since, and my, my understandings are generally correct. And um, so, you know, I, but it is, it's not, it's not at all modern standard Hindi. And as Hindi, like all languages, evolves, you know, people are having more and more difficulty understanding uh, this kind of Hindi. If, if you're raised in the area around where Tulsidas lived, in the sort of uh, Lucknow, Fezabad kind of area, um, and you're a villager, and you still speak a very village dialect, this comes easily to you. But that's relatively a uh, small audience at this point. So yeah, I mean, the basic answer to your question is yes. I, I had, to, had to immerse myself in a, in a rather archaic literary dialect. Mm -hmm. I think there was a question here. Right? Oh, no. Okay. See, I'm Philip. Huh. I met you earlier, like two, three years ago. Uh -huh. You are known as Gora Tulsidas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. So, <laughs> so, I have a question about sure. a Basundi Ramayana in uh, Uttarakhand. Uttarakhan. Yeah. Yeah. So, how was it for you to translating it? Because it's like... Uh, conclusion of all Ramayana, just in few uh, paragraphs. How was it for you to translate that? The, well, I'm not sure what, Na, you, mean, what is, you mean by is, the Bhushan Ramayana. It starts Ramayan. from uh, Nath ke Tarat Behu, Tav Darshan Khagraj, Ayosudehu. Pra, uh, let me read it. Nath ke Tarat Behu, Main Tav Darshan Khagraj, Ayosudehu Su, Karu Ab Prabhu Ayo Kehikaj. Is that, where, is where, that Garuda speaking to yes, Basundi? Yes, Garuda yeah. is asking to Basundi right. that you are here. Yeah. Why you are here? Then he then yeah. it's told that I got a problem with Mahadev, and then he told me yeah, he, yeah, yeah, to yeah, come. Yeah. So I, how was it for you to translate that Ramayan? Like in in Tulsi Das Ramayan, there's a there, a Ramayan there, by there a are Ramayans Sunday. told, yeah, and there's a synopsis, there's a short retelling of the Ramayana as Bushundi narrates it to Garuda. Uh, how was it? It was, you know, like all the other lines. I mean, I worked hard on it. Uh, I, I often would spend um, an hour on one chopai, you know. Um, 
so I'm not, sh I'm not sure how to answer your question. I, I happen to love Bushundi, and when it, if you read the introduction <coughs> to volume seven when it comes out, I, and I find him a very fascinating character. There, there has been a belief among Hindi scholars and Western scholars who, who learned from Hindi scholars in the 20th century that there must have been a text that Tulsidas was drawing on called the Bushundi Ramayana. I personally don't think there, there was. And I give my argument for this in the introduction uh, in brief. It's never been found. There, there is a Sanskrit text that was published under that name, but it is, is obviously an 18th century text that, that could not have been used by Tulsidas. And um, I think he took this Bushundi story, which comes probably out of the Yoga Vashishta, um, and ran with it and created this amazing character. Bushundi goes through multiple births. Uh, he tells his, his life story, but not one life, but quite a few. And, um, and he is a devotee of the uh, Ishtadeva Mama Balaka Rama. You know, my, my, my chosen god is the child Ram. He's a devotee of Ram as basically a toddler. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, it's, it, it, I, I, I love it, but I'm, I'm, I'm not able to s tell you how I translated it differently than anything else. I think else. what seems to be coming through in both these questions really is a desire to read the text. I mean, they're both quoting. So yeah. I think we'll come back to poetry, okay. but maybe after you finish, I think you had the, oh, there are more questions. All right. I'm going to just get the comment and then that yeah. will be the end. Okay. Mina, go ahead. Thank you. Um, what uh, this lady said uh, about uh, um, the, the short version of Ram Ramayana that she quoted reminded me of something that's very contemporary. A friend of mine who's a literary person as well as an IT person like myself, and her grandson is now turned 12, 13, and he was asked to write a diary as one of the characters of Ramayan, just the general story. And he wrote as Hanuman mm. that I don't understand why Ram gets all the praise. Mm. I did all the work. Yeah. And this, this young 12-year-old has you know, distilled for today's people a, a, a beautiful re-understanding of the work. I don't think it diminishes the Ramayana at all. I think it's brilliant in the way that it looks at for today's generation. What does that mean? You have to, un just as we voice the yeah. lesser known women she, characters. She makes me think of a chopai, so can I, yes, can absolutely. I do it? Because um, your, your, your friend's son, grandson, yeah. Um, you know, the epigram with which I start my book on Hanuman, uh, Hanuman's tale, is more is, is a line spoken by Bushundi in Uttarakhand in Tulsidas. More mana prabhu asa bisvasa, rama te adika, rama karadasa. In my mind, I have this conviction that Ram's servant is greater than Ram himself. Yeah, which is, I, I, I see that as kind of the essence of... Hanuman's popularity, but you can extend it to all of us, I guess. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, oh, we don't have time. Oh. Out of time. This conversation needs to Sierra. continue. Okay. Thank you so much, Philip Lutgendorf.